All right, good, good afternoon, everyone. And it, it's good to see you all again. This is uh, obviously David Peretz, and we are continuing with our lecture series on inequality rising. Um, and before I, I get started on that lecture series, uh, I'll, I'll take just a moment to reflect uh, a little further. Last week, I shared some good news with you, the news that the most recent models and projections suggest that we are actually getting the coronavirus contagion and pandemic contained better than we had uh, anticipated that we would be able to. And that as a result, the predicted number of fatalities is in fact going down and going down quite dramatically from the really quite frightening figures uh, that we were looking at a month ago. Now, having said that, it is still the case that as of today, over 40,000 Americans have died of this disease. Hundreds of thousands of people have died across the world. And, and I do think uh, it, it, it's a catastrophe, the magnitudes of which we have not seen since world wars, right? The, 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 this, this is an absolute human catastrophe. And, and we do need to acknowledge that. We need to acknowledge that many of us have been touched by it and that it will take a long time for us to process and recover. But I, I wanna emphasize something else, which is that the reason that those numbers have gone down, despite how dramatic they are, substantially gone down uh, from 250,000 to 60,000 projected fatalities with this round of the virus in this country is because of a remarkable feat of collective action and solidarity. Huge numbers of people, hundreds of millions of people are sheltering in place, are maintaining social distance and social isolation. Uh, millions of others are working heroically on the front lines of this in medical centers or putting themselves in harm's way to make sure that the rest of us can get the essentials that we need in life while isolating socially. But even those of us who are just doing what the health authorities, our leaders, our civic leaders as well, tell us to do, which is to not be vectors for spreading this disease. We know that this disease spreads even when you're not symptomatic. For many people, they will contract the virus and, and really just feel like they had a minor cold. Those people who are not at grave risk from this disease are staying at home, just like those who are more at risk due to age or health condition. And what this is illuminating is a kind of solidarity, a kind of collective spirit, a kind of concern for all of us that I think has been hard to find in this society and in many places in the world for quite a long time. Our society has been fractured and competitive, split and polarized for so long. And at the moment, we are actually coming together. And, and many people who are not in direct personal risk are, are nevertheless doing the right and the good thing. And what this shows us, among other things, is what we can accomplish when we come, come together right? 60,000 people instead of 250,000 people. We've literally cut the fatality for this disease by four times. And so many of the problems we face, I think especially of global climate change, but also of issues to do with inequality like those we're talking about in this lecture series and other issues to do with healthcare or managing our economy, et cetera, require collective action. 
And I just want to start by sounding the cautiously hopeful note that maybe one of the lessons we will take away from this awful episode is that there are things that we can accomplish when we come together that we cannot accomplish when we're fragmented and fighting and competitive. And it is urgent that we begin to solve some of those problems as well, which is then my transition into resuming this lecture series, uh, which is about inequality and, and the rapid and alarming rise in inequality in the United States and much of the rest of the world over the last 50 years. And, and so uh, last week we were uh, in the midst of introducing ourselves to the evidence of that inequality. And um, I just want to refresh your memory. So give you an overview quickly of the introductory topics. Uh, we talked for a while about why to focus on inequality in the midst of a pandemic. And there were two main reasons I suggested to you. One of them is that, as I say, the virus is spreading in the fault lines inequality has opened in our society. And I showed you a lot of evidence to suggest that though the virus is indiscriminate, it is nevertheless not equal in the impact that it's having. And those who are poor, those who are Latino or African American, those who live in less well-served areas, those who have no choice but to go to work and work in dangerous conditions are suffering the brunt of the illness and fatality from this disease. But it's, it's not only that, it's also that this disease and its aftermath, especially its economic consequences, which I will talk about at greater length today, but we saw yesterday that at this point, 26 million Americans have registered as unemployed in about the last month. And, and that's just an unprecedented large figure. It, it, it's orders of magnitude larger than anything we've seen in the past. Um, and it's undoubtedly an undercount because state unemployment offices have been overwhelmed. And you hear the stories of people going to the unemployment office day after day after day to just wait in line and to not even get their paperwork processed. And, and, and so the virus, in addition to attacking our inequality, is also going to exacerbate our inequality. I think there's little doubt about that. And, and that is part of the reason to be focused on this topic at this moment is because we need to be thinking about what we can do to help those who are least fortunate among us and to restore us to a more equal society. The second big topic uh, concerns uh, inequalities in um, the wealth, and income and health of America before the pandemic broke out. And uh, this is where we left off and I will return to this uh, topic now, but I want you to understand how much more unequal we have become and then some account as to why we've become so much more unequal. The third topic that we will get to today is what the coronavirus will do to the American and the global economy. Um, and it's obviously having extraordinary disruptive effects. It's, it, we are in the midst of a global recession that is far worse than anything we have seen since the Great Depression. And there's an open question about how long this will last and how deep this will be. I don't think we know the answer to that right now, but what we do know is that this is a catastrophic economic event in addition to being a catastrophic public health event. And I want to spend some time talking with you about that. And then finally, as, as a, a final theme, how the coronavirus might change American politics and how those changes might affect inequality. That's the, the, the final topic I want to turn to. To, to begin to, to dig down then on the um, 
second main topic, which is where we left off. Um, so uh, inequalities of, and, and I'm sorry, this should say, um, and I can fix it very quickly, income, wealth, and health in America before the great pandemic. And we had taken uh, a bit of a tour of that inequality and uh, concluded with a, a couple snapshots. And I wanna just refresh your memory about this. One of these snapshots shows you um, the distribution of the benefits of economic growth over the last 40 years. And what you see here with the black line is the rate of economic growth over the last 40 years. Uh, and, and this is fairly healthy economic growth. It's not fantastic. It's certainly not the rate that we saw in the post-World War II decades where growth was uh, about 4% per year. Over the last 40 years, it's been more like 2% per year, but, but globally, that's not a bad growth rate for a developed economy. But when we ask how the benefits of that economic growth have been distributed, we have a number of very different stories. Start with the people in the 90th to the 99th percentile of income. That's this red line here on this diagram. And what you see is that they have basically seen their income rise at almost exactly the rate the economy has grown. And all things equal, that is what should happen for everyone. That is to say, if everybody is contributing to economic growth, then economic growth should benefit everyone and benefit everyone roughly equally. I think if you're concerned about issues of justice and fairness, you might say that the people at the bottom should benefit more than the people at the top because the people at the bottom need the benefits of growth more. And if everybody benefits equally, our society is going to become more equal. That's the, the basic, uh, supposition of a progressive tax system. Now, if you are concerned about um, economic incentives, you might want some larger portion of the benefits to go to innovators and entrepreneurs. Um, and, and there is an argument for that. Uh, but I think even if you are convinced that you need to incentivize economic innovation, um, what we see here with the top 0.01% getting a 400% increase in their income over this 40 year period, while the bottom 50% got something more like a 20% increase and the middle 40% got something around a 60% increase while the top 1% got 150, 175% increase, we have a distribution problem. We have a problem whereby the benefits of economic growth in this country are not being fairly distributed to the people who live in this country, the people who make up this country. And this then is reflected in this diagram that I concluded with last week. And this diagram shows that we have increasingly steep economic, or I'm sorry, income gradients in our society. Uh, and just to refresh your memory, the light blue right shows you what the bottom 25% are making in 1967 through 2007 in 10 year increments, and then more recently 2013. I couldn't get the data for 2017. Um, so that's not a 10 year increment. The orange, that's the top 25%, the red, that's the top 5%, and then you've got the middle groups in between. And what you see is that in 1967 and 1977, we were all pretty close together. Even the difference between the bottom 25% and the top 5% was not that huge. And what we know about the way in which people think about their economic well being is that they tend to compare themselves with others 
at their historical moment. They don't look to the past, to their parents or to their own standard of living 20 years before. They look at how other people in their society at this moment are doing and we tend to look up. We tend to look at the people who are doing a little bit better than we are and say, how much better are they doing? Is, does that make me feel okay about myself? Does that seem fair? Does that seem like something maybe if I do a lot of hard work, I will be able to attain in my lifetime? And I think in 1967 or 1977, when you looked up, you saw people who looked a lot like you. And so you were able to say to yourself, this is not unfair. There may be some small differences, but there are differences that are not extreme and that I think perhaps over the remainder of my lifetime, I might be able to bridge. By the time you get to the 1990s, certainly last decade or this decade, what you see is inequalities that are so extreme that we essentially become incomparable. We seem increasingly like different castes, different kinds of people, different economic orders of society. We're no longer all members of the same society. We're inhabiting completely different social worlds because our wealth affords us such great differences in our standard of living, our well-being, our economic security. And again, I think that's in part what we are seeing with the coronavirus. So now um, there was a, a, a diagram I, I wanted to show you last week, I didn't get to. Um, this is about eco economic mobility. I showed you a slightly different diagram on this, but I think this one is much clearer. And what this shows is that in addition to be, having become much more unequal, recently we have become much less fluid or mobile as a society. So if you are born in the bottom 20%, this diagram shows that there's a 43% chance that you will stay there for the rest of your life, and only a less than 5% chance that you will make it to the top 25%. Alternatively, if you're in the top 20%, there's a 40% chance, if that's where you're born, that that's where you're going to stay, and a less than 10% chance that you're going to move all the way down to the bottom. And so another way of, of, of looking at this, um, uh, the issue of mobility in our society has to do with um, whether or not you're likely to do better than your parents over time. And, and what you see here is that in 1940, there was an over 90% likelihood, in 1950, an 80% likelihood, in the 60s and 70s, a 60% likelihood, and then beginning in 1980, an only a 50-50 chance, a, a coin toss, that you would be doing better than your parents. And by the way, we can't go further forward than this because we wait until people are 40 years old to measure their prospects for lifetime earnings. And so um, we, we don't know the data for people born in 1990 or 2000 yet because we can't really discern what their lifetime earnings are going to be. But the, the big point here is, in, in terms of this idea of the fading of the American dream, that for a long time, we believed in economic progress, in the sense that each generation will do better than the previous generation. And statistically and experientially, that's just not true anymore. We're not doing better than the previous generation. Many of us are stuck in place, seeing our incomes stagnant or eroded, and then the coronavirus comes along. And all of a sudden, 25 million of us are unemployed overnight. This is the uh, frayed, precarious economic landscape that the coronavirus is now penetrating. And so, the, the, the overview, I hope, is clear. Let me now get into the next main topic, which is how did we get here? How did we get from being a much more equal society to a much more 
unequal society? What happened over the last 50 years to generate the inequality, to uh, limit mobility? How did we change? And, and I'm gonna share a number of factors with you. This is not meant to be an absolutely thorough systematic explanation. I, I, I can't offer that today, but I do want to at least begin to introduce for you some of the most important factors. So to begin with, when we look at wages, um, what's happening to wages? And, and, and this diagram indicates the rate of wage growth, right? And, and, and so to be clear, um, this does not mean wages are going down, but what it means is that the rate at which wages are growing has been steadily declining since around 1950, so for a long time. And by the way, this is for all developed countries. It's not just for the United States. But what you see is that wage growth has, has declined from uh, being over around 4% a year to being under 2% a year. So, so the rate of wage increase has gone down by roughly 50% over these years. And the vast majority of us get our living from our wages, right? So if our wages are not increasing very rapidly, that means that we're not getting uh, wealthier very quickly. And one of the big factors here is that the people who are in the top 1% or 0.01% make most of their wealth not from wages, but from return on investment. And return on investment has been growing much more rapidly than wages have been growing. And so that opens up inequality in our society. Um, this diagram shows what's called the average labor share of economies. And I'm going to show you this data two ways, but I want to explain what it means first. This refers to the amount of overall income generated in a society that is paid out in wages. Again, remember that the vast majority of us, over 90% of us, make most of our income from wages, right? Uh, what percentage of the income in society comes to people via wages. And what you see again, again, these are for developed countries, I'll get into America specifically in a moment, is that in the 1950s, about two thirds of the income made in a, our societies was paid out in terms of wages. Uh, by the time we get to the 2000s, that's down to about 56%. And so wages have declined as an overall share of economic productivity and income in our society. People who make their money by wages are earning less of the wealth that's made in our economy. This is a, another way of, of measuring this, and this is now looking at the United States by itself and uh, again, they, they set the uh, uh, value at around um, 19, uh, I'm sorry, two, 2010. And what we see is a steady decline in the amount of uh, the income generated in our society that is paid out in wages for workers. Um, so, um, What's causing that? Why is it that wages are declining? They're not growing as quickly and less of the income generated in our society is paid out in this way. More of it is paid out in profits to shareholders, right? That's, that's the fundamental trade-off. Why is that? Again, I think one fundamental explanation it's not the only explanation, but certainly an extremely important explanation is the decline in union membership in our society. And, and so this diagram again shows for all developed countries what happened with unions from 1960 to quite uh, recently. And as I'll show you in a moment, 
These figures are actually worse for the United States. Um, but uh, let me uh, just um, right, show you the developed world first. And, and what you see is that uh, in around 1980, the height of union density, right? How many workers belong to unions around the world, at least the developed world? Over 45, approaching 50%. And right now, it's down to around um, 35%. In the United States, it's actually a fair bit lower uh, than that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, let, let me not go to that diagram right now. Let me just see. Is, is, is that it? No, uh, that's not it. So, so I will we'll stop there for now on union density. But all this to say, one of the fundamental things that's driving the inequality in our society is that more and more of the income that's generated in this society is being paid out to those who own stocks. Less and less is being paid out to wages. One fundamental factor has to do with the decline of unions. I'm going to pause there for a second. I've been talking for a while. I want to uh, hear your comments as well. And so, um, let me unmute you and uh, you can ask me a question if you have a question about what we've been talking about so far. Anyone have a question or a comment? The only comment I have is that it's very discouraging <laughs> to make a comeback if unions are finding unions and who's to speak for the workers? All right, so uh, thank you, Ann. Uh, and um, I, I, I agree with you uh, that obviously this is not a happy report. This is not good news. Having said that, I also think um, understanding what's been happening in our society is the first step to remedying it. And so it's why I'm sharing this information with you. Uh, and uh, if we understand that as union membership declines, less and less of the wealth generated in our society goes out uh, as wages and more of it goes out as profit, uh, that is then something we can do something about, right? We, we can figure out what we need to do to increase union density in the country and actually, we know how to do that. And, and I want to be clear. Uh, I, I've emphasized union density. I will emphasize other factors in a few minutes. Uh, but this is not exclusively about unions. This is about globalization as well. And in and, and, and later lectures, I will be talking in detail about what that term even means. But the fact is that in the middle of the 20th century, American workers were at most competing with German and Italian and French and English European workers, not with workers in China. That economy was essentially closed, not for the most part with workers in India. We have become much more interconnected globally, and the result is that American workers now compete with workers all over the world. And if the workers in less developed less rich societies will work for less, then the jobs will move there, or American workers have to compete, which means their wages have to go down. Uh, technology, the tr transition from a uh, manufacturing based to a information based economy, all of that is, is, is part of this picture also, and we will get to that momentarily. Um, Stanley, you wanted to ask a question, is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask a question, yeah. yeah. Go ahead. How, how much does the increase in automation uh, affect uh, the, um, the, the wages of, of labor? Excellent question. And um, I'll tell you two things. 
I, I can't assign a number to that. And, and, and we're in the domain where um, the thing that we're trying to explain is so complex. How much does globalization matter? How much does taxation matter? How much does the decline in unionization matter? How much does automation matter? I think it's very hard to si assign precise numbers uh, to each of those variables, in part because it's so complex, it's hard to disentangle them, in part because they interact with each other. But let me say two things. The, the, the first is we, we can look uh, industry by industry. And, and so in the 1960s, when you looked at an assembly line where an automobile was, was manufactured, I'm, I'm gonna make up numbers for you because I don't have them on the top of my head, but if I've got it right, it was something like 60 workers per car. Today, it's down to around 10 workers per car, right? Uh, and, and if you look at Tesla, as opposed to say Ford or Toyota, they're using even fewer workers because they have the most up-to-date, most automated assembly lines. Um, and, and so on the one hand, yes, you're absolutely right. Another way of looking at this is comparing Google and AT&T. And Google has uh, a similar market value today to what AT&T had in 1960, and they have about 1 20th the number of employees. Uh, and, and, and so, yes, automation, technological change has made uh, us more efficient, has made manufacturing and service providing more efficient. And the result is that we need fewer workers to do the same thing, right? So, so that is obviously driving wages down. But let me also say to you, and, and, and uh, I'm sorry to say it, 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 it gets worse. One of the things when, when I was reading this literature about automation a couple of years ago that everybody was saying, all the scholars who study this are, 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 are noting the economists and the technology experts, that we haven't seen the full wave of automation yet. That in fact, the technology exists now to make manufacturing and service provision even more efficient, even more automated, even less labor dependent than it is today. And what they said is, we don't expect this wave to break until the next big recession. It's big recessions that drive the transformation of the laboring process because at that point it becomes efficient for the corporations to invest money into transforming their laboring processes. And so, yes, automation is a really important factor. And unfortunately, it's going to get worse, not better. Uh, is, I, I thought there might have been one more question. Let me just uh, ask, is, yes. is there anybody else waiting yeah, to ask? I, no, have I, have a a I have a question. I have a question. I have a question. Has the concept of unionism declined? Uh, so, uh, the, the, when, when you say has the concept of unionism de declined, the rate of union membership has absolutely declined, right? Uh, and, and, and that's what this diagram shows here. And as I say, I've, I've got another diagram, which I'll try to show you next time if I don't get it to it this time which shows that in the United States, actually, we've always had less union membership than most other countries. And so if I've got it right, although this diagram shows union membership in the developed world to be about 35% in uh, the private sector of the economy, in the United States, it's down to less than 20% of our workers are unionized today. Um, but the concept of unionism, I, I'm going to run that slightly differently. Has the uh, ideology, has the political popularity or the idea 
that unions are good for workers and most workers should want to be unionized, declined, gone out of style? Absolutely yes. And, and, and one of the things that has happened is that over the last 50 years, a concerted battle has been fought against unions to try to discredit them, to try to make them appear corrupt, to try to make them appear um, unnecessary and confining for workers, uh, diminishing their economic freedom, coercing them into paying their dues. So yes, there has been a concerted battle against unions and it has in many ways succeeded. And in particular, given the un even policy environment in the United States, given the fact that many states have different policy regimes, there are many states now that have anti-union legislation, especially in the South, so-called free workplace legislation, which uh, does not allow a workplace to be an exclusively union workplace or makes it more difficult for unions to organize. And those states have uh, attracted manufacturing away from the traditional centers of manufacturing in the Midwest over the last 50 years because they have legislation that makes it more difficult to unionize or more difficult for unions to manage collective bargaining on behalf of workers. So I think the answer to your question is yes, this is not only they, there's fewer union members, it's because of a concerted political effort to make unionization appear less attractive, less popular, less beneficial to workers over the last 50 years. Uh, I know there's uh, one more question, at least. Who is it that wants to ask the next question? Uh, any cookies today? What was that? Any cookies? What, what was that question? Yeah, what's the question? So, just Graham? No. Yeah, uh, yeah I'm sorry. Oh, I don't believe you. Does, does anybody else <laughs> have a question right now? Oh, gee. Okay. Talking okay, about cookies. I have a comment um, to make. Yeah. Go ahead. Away from, getting away from unions. I think what has to be concentrated is education. In the field of education, that more people should be educated into different areas than are uh, than are where jobs would be available. Yeah, th thank you, Anne. And um, I, I I will comment on that briefly. And, and you guys are doing an excellent job of bringing out many of the factors that are relevant here. And, and one of the things that uh, we see, and, and, and let me see if I can show you a, a little bit of information on this, uh, the return um, on education, and, and I, I'm not actually, let, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the return on education, I'm, I'm not seeing the diagram right now, but I, I will be able to show it to you later. The return on education in our society um, is um, much greater now than it was before. Uh, let me get this to you at least one way, right? Um, if you look at this diagram, what you see is the rate of health insurance for those with no high school education and those with college education, right? Uh, and 30% yeah, of the people who didn't graduate high school don't have health insurance. 5% of the people who graduated college do. And don't, I'm sorry. And, and, and so it's six times as likely that you're not going to have health insurance if you didn't graduate from college as opposed to if you did graduate from, uh, I'm sorry, if you didn't graduate from high school as opposed to if you did graduate from college. And, and, and so that's one way of getting at the way in which education matters for inequality in our society right now. And obviously it's huge. Uh, and, and I do think that part of this has to do with the transformation in our economy away from manufacturing for which education was less important, less valuable into 
technology and service sector jobs for which at least a kind of technical education is extremely important. Um, and it also has to do with power differentials in our economy and the way in which our economy um, has assigned increasing economic value to education um, in part as a way of regulating who gets opportunity. So, so thank you for the comment, Anne. I'm going to move into the next big topic in the lecture. And so, uh, as, as you know, we've been looking at um, income inequality, what it's like and how we got there. I'm now going to transition into wealth inequality. And that's the, the, the next big topic for today. And uh, I'm going to start with a, a diagram that does this geographically. And I have to admit that I, I don't know that this is entirely reliable. I haven't been able to see the data myself, but I think it's a wonderful way to represent this. If the country as a whole were owned uh, according to the proportions of wealth that people own, 1% of the population would own this huge portion of the territory, I call it roughly everything west of um, the Mississippi, north of, I, I, I don't know, is, is that um, the Colorado River, right? You, the, a huge segment of the country, right? 1% of the population owns about 40% of the wealth in our country. So they own maybe 40% of the territory. If you then make it the top 10%, add the next 9%, they own more than three quarters of the country. The next 30%, so we're still in the top 50%, own all of this, right? The next 20%, so now we're going down to 60% of the population, own a territory the size of, of, of Texas. And the bottom 40% of the population, that, that's Austin, right? They own a tiny little fragment of the wealth in our society. So when we look at wealth as opposed to income, we're looking not at how much you make each year, but how much the assets you own are worth. What's your home? What's your savings account? What's your investment portfolio worth when you add them all together? And what we see here, and I think this is quite striking when you, when you look at this, is that for all Americans, um, their wealth increased relatively steadily until the Great Recession of 2008. And then it has declined quite dramatically. Uh, and, and that's primarily about housing values. And to be clear, for the vast majority of middle-class Americans, their single most important asset is their home. That's where the vast majority of their accumulated savings go. And what happened in 2008, 2009 is housing values in much of the country went off a cliff. And I expect we will see something like this happen again. I don't think the value of housing was as inflated in 2020 as it was in 2007. But when you have a major recession, people simply don't have the money to buy new houses housing values go down. And when that happens, for average Americans, their wealth goes down. And so if you look at this, by the time you get to 2010, the majority of Americans had seen their wealth decrease from 1990, as opposed to go up over that 20 year period. But the richest 10%, although they did see a decline in their wealth, began to see an increase again. Uh, and as you can see, if you're in the top 10%, and these are people whose wealth is not simply found in their homes, but found in their portfolios, they are doing much better economically in terms of their wealth than the rest of us. Now, having said that, obviously, what's happened in the stock markets in the last month or so 
is going to severely damage the wealth of even the richest Americans. Uh, let's look next at um, this in a slightly different way. Who saw wealth gains in the last uh, decade, 15 years? 90, the people at the 90th percentile saw gains. People at the 70th, 75th percentile saw losses of around 15%. Median households saw losses of 30%. And people in the bottom quarter of our society saw losses of more than a third of their wealth. And I shared with you last time we spoke this figure, this, this sad, stunning figure that more than 40% of Americans don't have $400 saved in an emergency account to deal with an emergency. Why is that? Well, among other things, because their wealth has been declining as opposed to growing over time along with their incomes. So now there's a, another way of looking at what's happening with wealth, and that's to look at it by age as opposed to by wealth bracket. And when we do that, what we see is that older Americans are actually doing quite well in terms of wealth. Some of this has to do with when they acquired their wealth. Some of this has to do with lifetime income. They are the beneficiaries of the more equal economy of uh, the post-war periods going into the 1980s, 1990s. People who are 55 to 65 um, essentially saw their wealth increase and decrease and are before the uh, crash of the last month at least still about even from where they were 20 years ago. But if you look at people under 35 or under 55, they're all in negative territory. And one of the things I wanna point out to you is if you ask um, why it is that younger Americans are supporting Bernie Sanders or were supporting Bernie Sanders in such large numbers, when Bernie Sanders' message is that the economy is rigged, that it doesn't work equally well for everyone, I think data like this that shows that young Americans really are not doing well. They are not increasing their wealth over time. They are not able to save. They're not able to own a home. They're not able to invest. They're burdened by debt. That helps to explain why a candidate like Bernie Sanders, who calls himself a democratic socialist, who is strongly in favor of forgiving student loan debt of making our society more equal is so popular among those younger people. Now this next diagram is, is going to be a little tricky to read, but I promise you I will unpack it for you and help it to make sense for you. And now we're getting into uh, wealth over a longer period. Um, this is from 1962 to 2018. And, and what this shows you is the bottom 50% of Americans, uh, the next 40%, the top 10%, the top 1%, the top 0.01%, and the 400 richest adults in the country. And what you can see is that um, on the one hand, for everybody except for the top 0.01%, there have been modest increases in wealth over this 50 plus year period, right? Uh, for those at the bottom, their wealth has gone up by 1.5 times. For the next 40%, 3.5 times. For the top 0.1%, 7.3 times. And this then compares what's going on with their wealth with what's going on with their tax rate. And this is, I think, quite stunning, which is to say that for the bottom 50% of Americans, while their wealth has barely budged over this 50 plus year period, their taxes have gone up, not down, right? Whereas when you get to the top 10%, their taxes have gone down modestly from 33% to 29%.
And when you start getting into the top 0.01% or the 400 richest adults in this society, right? People who've seen their wealth go from 276 million to uh, 1.3 billion dollars, right? Per individual or per family you see their taxes have decreased dramatically, right? And I know it's a little hard to read, but from over 50% to under 25%. And so what this shows is that part of the explanation here is what has been happening with taxes. And, and so this shows the contemporary picture. Um, and what it shows is that we have a regressive tax system in this society, not a progressive tax system that redistributes from those who have the most to those who have the least, but quite the opposite, right? So you can see uh, by income percentile, the 10th, the 20th, the 30th, the 40th percentile, right? The bottom 50%, um, their taxes, uh, total tax rate, uh, around 25%, right? For the next 40%, those, these are people whose income is under $20,000 a year. These are people whose income is over 20, but under 75. Their tax rate goes up uh, from around 25% to around 29%. The top 9% are paying a little bit more in taxes, around 27%. The top 1%, a little bit more, around 30%. But those top 400 individuals who have billions and not millions of dollars, their tax rate is down at 23%. And if you look at it, it's not only less than the average tax rate, it's less than the tax rate for any of the bottom 50%. And, and so another thing that has happened in this country, and this is primarily about corporate earnings and capital gains taxes going down while income taxes uh, did not go down as dramatically and did not go down progressively, our tax system has come to be highly beneficial to those who earn the most via investment, via capital gains, uh, have homes that are worth a lot and have a mortgage uh, payment deduction and people who uh, get their income through stock dividends instead of through wages. Our tax system is built to increase, not to decrease inequality. And that's another big factor in both the differences in income, but especially the differences in wealth. I want to just share one more piece of data with you. And, and this is a, a kind of it doesn't have to be this way diagram. So this shows you what happened in France as opposed to what happened in the United States. And what I think is extremely important to notice here is that in France, when productivity went up, right? That's the, the dark line. Um, wages also went up. That's the dotted line, right? And whereas in the United States, those two lines parted company a long time ago. Uh, uh, so that's uh, this diagram, right? We have our productivity here, but our wages down here for the bottom 40%, and the bottom 50%, I'm sorry, the bottom 50% and the middle 40%, uh, for France, they've remained coupled. So there's a much fairer distribution of the benefits of productivity in another country that in many ways is like the United States. All right, so why don't I stop there I believe I've given you a fair bit more information about the nature of inequality in this lecture, where I will pick up in the next lecture is uh, looking at what the pandemic will do to the American and the global economy. But I do want to uh, leave another couple minutes for questions and comments, focus more on wealth than on income this time.
So I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Um, no talking about cookies unless you want to share them with all of us, okay? This is Andy. Do, can I be heard? Yes, Andy, go ahead. I was curious, where would you classify people who can afford to live here in the percentile uh, brackets? Uh, you you want to take a stab at that, Andy? I bet you've got to get it. I, I, how much I longer we can I, afford? The top 10%? I, could, I think in a top how, 10%. Top 10. Yeah, yeah no, top I, 10%. I, so I don't know the details, Andy. I don't know how exactly how much it, it, it costs to live there. But I know that it's expensive. And I, I know that um, in many ways, you obviously, either through your own success or, or through those she who love to and support you, are doing reasonably well. And, and, and certainly, that, that's something to be thankful for. I mean, frankly, you are retired in the way that all people should be retired, right? And, and, and our society is getting older, and we do have a crisis of um, uh, longevity, if you will. Uh, people are living, there's, there's what's called a lifespan revolution going on. People are living literally a decade or more longer than they were living a generation ago. And, and so, um, one of the things that we are going to have to deal with is how we support people who live longer once they're no longer working. And um, I do think the critical variable here is dignity. And, and I, I can see a little bit into some of your apartments because we're on camera right now. Um, and I speak with you and visit with you on a regular basis. My sense is that um, there are some indignities of growing older. And there's nothing much we can do about those. But in terms of your physical, your material level of support, your surroundings, that you are treated the, quite well. Uh, and, and that does mean, frankly, that you're probably in the top 10 or 20% to be able to afford the kind of care and conditions that your community provides for you. David? Yes, I why do you uh, what explains, what explanation do you have for the similarity um, in France of the wealth moving upwards along with the, um, the economy moving upwards with the labor? Why is, why couldn't we do that? <laughs> Good question. And, and the reason I show that data that the, the France, and let me go back to this, is, is uh, doing uh, so much better in, in terms of allowing their workers to get a fair share of the wealth their society is generating so that wages increase in tandem with productivity is to show that it is possible to do this, right? So, so what has France done that the United States hasn't done? We'd have to, to really unpack this, and I'm not in a position to do so today, but, but they've maintained a much higher rate of unionization. They've maintained much more progressive redistributive taxation. They have a much stronger public health system, and they spend a lot more on the public provision of uh, social security broadly understood, not just retirement benefits, but health insurance, et cetera. And so I'll, I'll refresh your memory on this diagram. France spends more than any country in the world on public education, on public health care, on housing benefits, where the United States, when our inner, neighbor, inner city neighborhoods got desperately poor, in the 1980s with um, white flight into the suburbs. Uh, and uh, at the same time, we withdrew investment from public schools in the inner cities because our funding for education is locally based. 
we withdrew social services. One of the terrible things you're, you're hearing about with the pandemic is that there are, are tens of thousands of people living in the city of Detroit who do not have water provided by the city. The city has stopped maintaining its public utilities for all neighborhoods in the city, right? Um, the French, had something similar happen in terms of concentration of <clears throat> urban poverty developing in the 1980s and 1990s, <coughs> excuse me for one moment. What they did was the exact opposite of the United States. We disinvested from our poorest neighborhoods. The French poured money into their poorest neighborhoods to increase funding for schools, to increase training for unemployed workers, to create community centers so people would have places to go for social support so they wouldn't be attracted to gangs, etc. All that to say, it's a complicated comparison. It's not a simple comparison. But I think one thing you can say about the French is that they have deliberately tried to counteract some of the forces that are producing inequality in a globalized economy. And you compare that just with the taxation system in the United States, and in many respects, we are augmenting, amplifying the inequality instead of counteracting. Thank you for the good question, Ann. Um, anybody else have a question at this point? There's nothing that can be done about the inequality in taxes for the top five and one tenth percent paying the least. Oh, that is. So um, who who was that that just asked that question? Harriet. Okay, Harriet. Um, yeah, of course, there's something that can be done. You change the tax code, and and I'm not going to go into this today. We're essentially out of time, but I will give you a whole lecture a few weeks from now on proposals to restore equity and progressivity to the tax code in the United States. There are very good proposals. It's, it's complex. Again, we don't just have to sock it to the rich, right? We have to be able to chase money into tax havens because a lot of what's happening in the world today is people are transferring their money out of countries that have progressive tax regimes and into countries that allow them to shelter their money from taxation right and and, and so it takes in certain respects a global effort not just a national effort but absolutely yes there are things we could be doing to change the tax code to to make it fairer the distribution of the wealth our society generates. Thank Anyone you. Anyone else with a, a final question for today? One quick question. Go ahead. I, no I it's noticed it's your it's background is, is absent the uh, item you had, which I found very interesting. That it was like a tapestry, and you said all of the symbols were uh, identification uh -huh. for God. Yes. That was the last lecture you had that, and I know, don't notice it today. Yeah, well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I, I can do this. Can you, can you see it's still there? <laughs> oh. I changed. <laughs> and, and, and so let me just say real quickly, you see that sculpture there? Pull your back. I'm just listening yeah. at the end of the lecture. Yeah. That, that's a, a, a sculpture of Abraham Lincoln. Uh, uh -oh. and, and so um, I have wow. my uh, Persian carpet with the uh, symbol fun. of God. Oh, gee. I have my symbol of my secular hero. Uh, and, and I'm still getting my home office set up. I, I usually work from school, but these days that's not possible. So yes, you're, you are- It's very important. Yeah. <laughs> Why can you go, can you? 
Which school are you? The whole lecture giving the uh, identification of all those symbols on that tapestry. Yeah, well, I, that that's beyond my ability. I do not read first. Uh, I teach at Brown College. That, that's my my primary academic affiliation. All right, everybody. It's it's been right. fun getting Thank to you. visit with you again. Take care. Thank you. Look forward to Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.